Hello, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news, topics, and events going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online community for everyone who's interested in Jungian and depth psychologies. And my guest today is Mark Winborn, and Mark is a Jungian psychoanalyst and a clinical psychologist who received his Ph.D. in clinical psychology from the University of Memphis and his Certificate in Jungian Psychoanalysis from the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in 1999. So Mark has been around the field for quite some time, and I'm very excited to have him with me today because he is the author of a book, which is going to be the featured book for the August 2012 free online book club on Deaf Psychology Alliance. And his book is called Deep Blues, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journey. Mark, thanks for being on the show with me today. Welcome. Well, thanks, Bonnie. I really appreciate the invitation to participate in this. And Depth Psychology Alliance is such a great resource and a community for everyone, and so I'm happy to participate. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. And, of course, you know, we've, we do a lot of different things in the community of Depth Psychology Alliance but one of my favorite things that we have done this year is the book club. And for those who are just hearing this for the first time, the book club is free, and it's all done in a written format so that you can participate at whatever schedule works for you, at whatever level of participation works for you. Every month there's a new author who tends the book club with their book, and all of those conversations or discussions, if you will, that are written out our archive for later perusing, I guess you could say. So you can go back and read through what's gone on in any of the other months. But meanwhile, let's talk about your book, because this is a really interesting and unusual topic. It's not something that we've done, at least uh, in any of the other months. And and I, frankly, I haven't seen a lot of books that focus on both Jungian psychology and the blues. So, Mark, maybe you could start us off by telling us a little bit about how you got interested in the blues. Well, you know, that goes back a, a long ways. Uh, I, I think when I was around 13 or 14, you know, I was playing music in the school band and had a trombone teacher who was turning me on to all kinds of music, and blues was one of those, and I found an old Lightning Hopkins album, and this would have been back in the mid-'70s, and the blues just wasn't a very big thing then, and so it was hard to find albums, And but there was something about the depth of what was transpiring even to my young adolescent heart and soul that really spoke to me in a very moving way. And uh, once I got turned on to the blues, I started going to as many concerts as I could. Or They weren't really concerts, I guess. They were performances. Uh, you know, and a lot of the old blues guys were still around and traveling through my area like Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee was one I saw when I was maybe in the seventh grade, and just the power of the music really said something to me, and I didn't really know why at the time. In reflecting on it now, there's an analyst named Bill Williford who wrote a paper on the blues that I was introduced to, and he said, the blues is an extraordinary development in the education of the heart. And I think that was really what I was looking for, was something that would help to educate my heart. Mm. That's a really beautiful way to look at it. And, of course, I think all of us have had that experience at one time or another of listening to some kind of music. Or I think art also has that kind of effect on us to be able to look at visual images and see those sort of things. You know, that kind of aspect that is not necessarily our thinking rational mind that is able to connect to something that is appealing to our senses in a different way and this idea of being able to experience something through the heart is really powerful and I think a really fundamental piece of depth psychology as well. Right. Now, the blues, however, is a very interesting sort of music. It's, it may not be one that everybody is super familiar with or maybe they've heard a little bit of it and, and haven't necessarily engaged with it to the extent that you have. And, and I have to say you're really lucky that you grew up where you did and that you're in the South because you know, I grew up in Idaho, and I don't—I can't say that I ever even heard the blues when I was a kid. I, right. I definitely was older before I was really introduced to different kinds of music. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the history of the blues for those who aren't as familiar with it. Well, yeah, the, the history is really fascinating. The term blues comes from a, a term that was around in the 1800s that talked about blue devils. 
which referred to contrary spirits that were seen as hanging around and creating sadness. Mm. So they just kind of shortened that phrase and began to speak about the blues. But the blues actually originate in West Africa. If you listen to some of the tribal music from West Africa, that would have been the same type of music that people who eventually became enslaved and transported to America would have been hearing, it is so astonishingly similar, not in terms of the lyrical content, but in terms of the rhythms and the monotone drones that they use with their instruments. And in West Africa, they were the, each tribe often had someone they referred to as a griot, who was kind of the tribe's archivist of musical stories that preserved the tribe's history and culture. And so these songs came over with the African slaves in the form of songs and chants. And then as they were forced into these new conditions, they became known as arhulis, which were work songs that helped them coordinate their efforts in the fields, in planting and things like that, or cutting wood. And so entire groups of people would be singing these chants, these songs, as a means of helping them get through the day. They were carried into the prisons, became prison work songs, chain gang work songs. And then around the late 1800s, from these work songs of former slaves and sharecroppers and prisoners, this style of music that became the blues originated in the Delta Cotton country of North Mississippi. And that's really uh, a very condensed history of it. But you can see that it really evolves out of trauma. Mm. It's a response to trauma. And that's one of the reasons I think it has such applicability to the notion of healing that resides in depth psychology is that this was a response to trauma, a creative, heart-connected response that allowed them to not just endure certain hardships, but actually transcend hardship, to make it something new, make it something creative, and make it something that spoke to their soul in a comforting way at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow, that's a really beautiful history. I just so appreciate the way that you told that. And, of course, I had no idea of all of the aspects that you've just mentioned as far as where it came from. For those who are interested in, we we haven't really talked about the book itself so much, and, and I have a couple more questions that I would like to ask you about the relationship between the blues and, and union psychology specifically, which, of course, is where we're headed, and and you just kind of alluded to that. But I do want to direct people who would like to read a summary of the book to the webpage that is offering information for the book club. You can find that at www.depthinsights.com, D-E-P-T-H-I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S.com. And, of course, Depth Insights is sort of the media arm of Depth Psychology Alliance, where everybody can go and find information about what's going on on the Alliance, because the Alliance is by membership. It is free to join, but maybe not everybody necessarily wants to join until they're sure that there's something there for them. So if you go to depthinsights.com and click on the link for the book club, you can go to August and see the information about Deep Blues. And I'd just like to read something, Mark, which you actually provided to me when we put this webpage together. And it says, In our increasingly isolated and technologically engrossed culture, there are fewer and fewer opportunities to move into these shared experiences of unitary reality in which the bubble of our individualism is pierced, allowing a felt relational connection to our environment and those around us. And I think when you talk about the story of the blues coming across the waters, you know, how it started with the tribes and then coming across the waters and and turning into these work songs and the slaves who were singing these, it really created for me such a powerful image of connectedness. That's exactly the kind of imagery that was emerging for me. And I feel like this idea of a unitary reality is so profoundly enhanced through music, and particularly, of course, this kind of music, as you mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and why music tends to do that for us? 
I suppose this is probably the connection between Jung's psychology. So if you want to go there, you can do that. Well, uh, the first thing I'd say uh, is I want to go back to this comment you made about art and all forms of music accessing this uh, this level of the heart, this level of emotion. And I think that's absolutely true. I think the thing about the blues that's a little bit different is it's actually a style of music. To me, as far as I know, the only style of music where the explicit purpose is to access emotion. Mm. Because the blues is a style of music, but the blues also refers to a particular set of feelings. And so the whole music is generated in order to connect to those emotions. So sometimes music or art can also entertain, it can provide relief, but the blues is always attempting to get one deeper into connection with the things that are going on in one's heart, in one's soul. So in terms of the connections between Jung and the blues, or analytical psychology and the blues, the first thing I'd say is that the blues is almost always singing about things that are of an archetypal nature, mm. things of universal human experience. There's not a lot of fluff and posturing in the blues. It's about lost love. It's about joy. It's about sexuality. It's about rage, sadness, grief oppression, addiction, being the outlaw. These are all universal themes that cut across all cultures. And so the blues has something to say and something to connect with in all cultures. So it's this archetypal basis that the blues men and women are singing about that I think provides that universal experience that Jung talks about in the notion of archetypes. Now, the other thing is the one you've already mentioned, this idea of unitary reality, which is a concept that originated with a Jungian analyst named Eric Neumann, where he was trying to provide an umbrella concept that kind of incorporated a lot of different things Jung was talking about, the, the most important one being participation mystique which is a term that refers to a sense of connection between one being and another. Even in more aboriginal cultures, often that connection might be felt between a person and an inanimate object. A rock, in other words, could have a sense of being alive to them. An animal could have a sense of having an individual soul to them. A tree might have a spirit. These were all things that Jung observed in his travels to the desert southwest of the United States and, in, and viewing the Navajo and Pueblo tribes as well as his trips to Africa. And so he wanted to understand what was going on of how could these people have this sense that they were connected to all things, all parts of being were intermixed because that's so different than most Western consciousness experiences things. And so he started to talk about these things as participation mystique. And Neumann takes it just a bit further by providing an umbrella concept that covers participation mystique as well as other things. And what Neumann says, it's the reciprocal coordination between psyche and the world the world around it. So in the blues, this takes place between the blues performer and their instruments, between the performer and the audience, that there's this shared reality going on in which there's not much of a separation between the performer and the audience, between the performer and his instrument. So if you're listening to the blues, often you'll hear like, for example, B.B. King, he talks to it, his guitar is named Lucille. <laughs> and there's a whole story behind why she's named Lucille. And periodically, during the course of a song, he'll say, sing, Lucille, and then the, the music will just be from the guitar. But it's like a dialogue going back and forth and back and forth, and you really get a sense of this very shared 
emotional connection between B.B. King and his guitar. Mm -hmm. Wow, I've had my own experience of several different emotions as you've gone through this journey of explaining a number of different things that I really wasn't aware of. And I'm just taken back to one of your first comments as we began the show about this education of the heart. And I'm realizing the capacity that the blues have as a vehicle to really help us tap into something that we don't always pay attention to. And, of course, again, that's at the core of depth psychology. Jung was very aware, particularly the longer he lived in his life, of what he called the collective unconscious and, of course, the life and the life force that really runs kind of under the surface of our everyday egoic activities. And the word that occurs to me as you described how the blues emerge from trauma and the capacity for us to tap into all of these emotions is communion. And it's communion with ourselves and, as you said, with sometimes objects that really come alive for us. I mean, the story of B.B. King and the guitar, Lucille, is really a great example Mm -hmm. of of that, about how something can be so alive for us and we can have relationships with these things that in our everyday lives, at least I, I guess I'll speak for myself, but it's so easy to go about what we're doing and, and just look at things as inanimate objects and think that we are at the center of the universe and we're the only ones that are alive and active and thinking. But, of course, that's the challenge of the thinking mind as well. Right, and the blues world really sees beyond that. I mean, they, Jung has another concept that he talks about, the anima mundi, which is the world soul. And T-Bone Walker has this song called Mean Old, mean old World. And the first line is, this is a mean old world to live in by yourself. And when you hear that, you, you really think about the world as having a personality that can be experienced. Mm-hmm. Or when Elmore James sings a, a, a song called The Sky is Crying, and in the first line, the rain are the tears of the world that then mix with the tears of the singer as he cries about his lover having left him. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no distinction made. Mm-hmm. Or another song that I just love is a song by T-Bone Walker called Stormy Monday. And the first line goes, the eagle flies on Friday and Saturday night I go out to play. Mm -hmm. So you get this sense of the pleasures and excesses that will take place. And then it goes on to, Sunday I go to church and I kneel down and pray. And this is what I say, Lord have mercy on me, Lord have mercy on me. So in the blues world, there's not this either or distinction that's frequently made of you're either in the sacred world or you're in the profane world. They coexist side by side without contradiction. And I think you bring up another important point here because what occurs to me is we live at such a a fast pace. And in some ways I think we have become so accustomed to making those sort of polar distinctions, you know, good and evil, this and that, and and having to choose between two extremes often just to be able to kind of move through our day and get things done. But there's so much value to being able to slow down and just feel into things. And again, you know, by putting on this kind of music, part of it's the words, part of it I'm sure you would agree are the notes, Part of it is the vast history that it carries with it because the the blues themselves are alive, clearly, and have a the, all of this history that you've mentioned and brought to us. But the capacity that it gives us to actually sink into emotion, which is a reality that we don't often pay that much attention to, is one of the most powerful things that I can think of. And in some ways, actually, and, and this kind of leads me to my next question, it's something beyond the ordinary. It's something that can be quite numinous, as you described it, to to talk about things that created awe or beyond the ordinary, striking us in a very unique and powerful way. You mentioned the history in Africa, and that was the connection that I made to shamanism. But can you talk to us about 
some of the connections between the, the blues performers and different kinds of shamanism. How do these two seemingly separate activities, I guess to some of us, really have some overlap between them? Well, uh, yeah, the connections are very powerful. Merce Eliade talks about different characteristics of the shamanic role, and he breaks them down into the shamanic calling, the initiatory sickness, the obtainment of shamanic powers, and the shamanic cure, which usually involves the shaman often taking the illness into himself and then uh, metabolizing it in some way and then expelling it either back into the patient, in a sense, in, in a form that they can then tolerate or expelling it out completely. So the, the whole idea of taking in the sickness and having their own psychic process work on it is very common to shamanic activities. And all of those things are present in the blues, what we could call the blues mythology. Many people have heard the story of how Robert Johnson, who is widely considered the uh, greatest blues guitarist who ever lived, who, according to mythological legend, went down, you've heard the song, Down at the Crossroads, that was sung by Eric Clapton. That was actually a Robert Johnson tune. And the legend is that he wasn't such a good guitar player at one point. And so he disappeared for about a year. And when he came back, his proficiency on the guitar and his capacity to sing had improved so dramatically that nobody believed that it was possible to get that much better in such a short time. And the story is is that he went to this intersection of two highways in North Mississippi, uh, near Clarksdale, Mississippi, and met Satan at the crossroads, and that Satan took his guitar from him, tuned it, handed it back, and at that point invested Robert Johnson with these miraculous musical powers. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, that story parallels so many elements that the mythologist Mircea Eliade outlined about the shamanic role. And some of the things that shamans use in their shamanic role are gestures, the use of masks often, sound, silence, rhythm, respiration, and movement. All of these seven characteristics that are common to almost all shamanic activity are also relied on extensively by bluesmen and women in their performances. They don't actually wear a mask, but they take on a persona of the bluesmen. They utilize moments of silence to accentuate important emotional shifts in the songs. They use the rhythm of the song to create kind of a hypnotic induction. There's a building of respiration as the song intensifies. You know, all of these things are present that if you put the, the two side by side, the traditional shaman and the bluesman, it would be really hard to differentiate the two. Well, that's an absolutely fascinating comparison that you're making. I, I would never have thought about those different correlations between the two. Are you, Mark, are you the first one to really write about this, or do you know of others who have also made these same correlations? Um, not in, I would say not in exactly the same way I've made it. There's a couple of other people that have written about blues, not at book length, but a guy named Stephen Diggs wrote an article about the blues and Western consciousness in spring a number of years ago, and Bill Williford that I mentioned earlier, who's a union analyst with the Interregional Society, wrote one back in the early 80s, uh, uh, that was quite a, a nice piece. But again, both article-length pieces rather than a more in-depth look that I've given it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that's why it makes your book Deep Blues. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll give you the, the whole title, Deep Blues, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journey. It, I think it, it's so unique because I personally have not seen, and I've looked at a lot of depth and union literature, 
have not seen anything quite like it. And, and again, the correlation that you're making um, between the shamanic process, which I'm also very interested in, with the blues is very unique and just absolutely fascinating. I haven't read your book yet, but I, I am just so excited to dig into it and so looking forward to being able to do that as soon as August 1st rolls around and the book club starts. It's a perfect excuse to be able mm-hmm. to dive in. So I'm just so grateful that you're willing to share your time to attend the book club in August on Depth Psychology Alliance. Mark, you know, you, you've made some allusions now on several occasions to the capacity for the blues to really do some deep emotional work to facilitate emotional healing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's a really fascinating thought as well. Well, in, you know, the whole Jung's whole notion of healing healing was built around the idea of the transcendent function. Two positions are butting up against each other and that somehow we have to find a way to hold those tensions in a symbolic way until something new emerges that transcends those two positions. So that's why I mentioned earlier that this dichotomy of experience tends to get moved beyond in the blues, where going out on Saturday night and having a good time and then going to church on Sunday and feeling reverent can both take place in the same song. Things can coexist, love and hate, staying and leaving, good and evil, without this experience of internal contradiction. So I think that naturally leads us to transcend the contradictions, the conflicts that we feel in ourselves. By giving voice to it, by someone else giving voice to some of the conflicts we feel internally, we get a chance to step outside for a moment our own sense of conflict and recognize the universality of the conflict. When we hear somebody else singing about something that sounds so similar to our own experience, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it can make us feel, allow us to feel less isolated in our own suffering at times. But the thing that I think is most healing about listening to the blues, if one does it in depth particularly, is that in the blues philosophy, as I call it, that's expressed through the music, includes the idea that the blues is something to be accepted. In other words, suffering is something to be accepted, not something to be gotten rid of or fixed, Mm -hmm. as some of the HMO culture would like us to do. But blues is experienced, lived through, and survived. It's not conquered or overcome. Mm -hmm. One hopes to eventually feel better, but the intent is to acknowledge and cope with this experience and recognize that it's going to come around again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's the mythology of the great round, that all life is in some sense is circular and when we stop trying to get around it or avoid it we're much better able to engage it and for it to take on a deeper meaning rather than a feeling of annoyance or persecution by it Mm -hmm. yeah there's something really powerful about the capacity to as you mentioned hold the tension long enough with something, whether it's emotions that we may not necessarily welcome or experiences that we may not necessarily have asked for, or uh, even when we find ourselves caught in the grips of complexes or, you know, challenges that emerge for us. Of course, Jung always talked about holding those two opposites and and allowing that transcendent function to emerge. If we just repress them and we, we try to move past them or fix them, as you say, of course, our experience is going to be very different and and they will come back around. They will come back around anyway, but there's something so really powerful about being able to sink into something like grief and allow it to move through you and move you and emerge in a new and different way than to just push away something like grief or struggle, as you said. Yeah, I'd like to just read a a brief lyric from a song called Hard Times Ain't Going Nowhere by Lonnie Johnson. Hmm. And he's saying, people raving about hard times, I don't know why they should. If some people was like me, they didn't have no money when times was good. (laughs) 
and and then a passage, a short passage from answer, Jung's answer to Job, where he says, "It is far better to admit the affect and submit to its violence than to try to escape it. The violence is meant to penetrate to a man's vitals, and he to succumb to its action. He must be affected by it; otherwise, its full effect will not reach him." Now, if those aren't two parallel sentiments expressed in a very different way but still talking about the same thing i don't know what is wow i have never heard that quote from young that's really profound yeah that's great i i really i'm so fascinated by this i just it's just not an area of study that i've ever looked at so i hope that our listeners are also really enjoying this from a, a level of a, a beginner's mind even if you know something about the blues and enjoy them already on a regular basis, I think that this is something that's just very new and interesting to think about. Mark, what are some of the recommendations that you might have for somebody who would like to become more familiar with blues music? I have to say I'm definitely motivated myself to do that. Well, yeah, I do give a, in the back of the book, I give a, an appendix with recommended listening. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, but it does give a number of places to start. It's difficult to imagine going wrong with Robert Johnson, the complete recordings. Some other early, what I would call a Delta acoustic blues, would be Sun House, Skip James, Blind Willie Johnson, or some of the chess records artists of the 1950s and 60s, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Sonny Boy Williamson, or more contemporary, B.B. King, or Stevie Ray Vaughan, for example. Uh, those would be just a few of the artists that I'd start with, but I list about oh, maybe 25 or 30 artists in the back of the book, and that's a good place to start. I do have a Facebook web page called Deep Blues, that I put up videos uh, about twice a week of blues performances, both old and new. So you get quite a exposure uh, to a variety of styles by looking at that page regularly. And often I'll do a theme week, for example, of train song blues or lost love blues. You know, take a particular theme that's often heard in the blues and then present a number of songs about the same theme. Mm, that's great. I'm definitely going to be checking that out. And, of course, something I hadn't mentioned in the introduction, which I should have, is that you also play the blues, Mark. You've had your own band in the past. Right. Yeah, when I, when I first started working on this, I was in training as an analyst, and I thought, you know, I've got to stop being a listener. I need to be more actively engaged. I need to move beyond being just a listener. And so I started playing harmonica, did that on my own for a period of time and then started playing down on Beale Street here in Memphis, which is really seen as one of the homes of the blues, where B.B. King got his start and played with a little band called the Blue Blake Band for a while and then had another band after that that I fronted called the Wolf River Travelers. That's quite a unique combination to be both a Jungian analyst as well as a musician in this way. So it's really wonderful that you have managed to do both, and I'm just, again, so grateful for you for sharing this experience with us. You know, one of the best things I was thinking as you were listing all of those wonderful resources and recommendations for music for the rest of us to listen to blues is the benefit of having the the technology that we do to be able to just go to iTunes or, or somewhere else online and find some of this music and be able to download it and have it instantaneously. We no longer have to rely on where we live or our experience or waiting for it to find us. We can actually go out and find it right away. Oh, uh, it which really is, is fabulous. In fact, I do a, when I'm out speaking at some conferences and things and I'm, I'm presenting on this, there's so much that's available on YouTube alone that now the lecture really comes alive with all of these videos of all of these great performers and their audiences mm -hmm. uh, because you really get a chance to see the interaction between the blues performer and the audience in a very different way than you can experience me just talking about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yes, and as we've established, that's such a big piece of it, this whole communion and unitary reality and the back and forth between the musician and the other elements around him Mm -hmm. or her. So, well, this is just great. I will also say that, you know, lucky for all of us, the technology makes it possible for everybody who is interested and wants to join the book club for the month of August to be able to do so immediately. You can find out more about Mark Winborn, who is a Jungian psychoanalyst and, of course, the author of the August featured book on the Depth Psychology Alliance Book Club. The book is Deep Blues, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journey. So, again, if you go to depthinsights.com, you can find all the information about Mark. There's much more on his bio that, of course, we haven't had time to go into here. And then there's a great synopsis of the book. You'll find even more than what we've just talked about here. There's also a link if you want to order the book so that you can have it in time for the uh, August 1st kickoff for the book club. And, of course, again, you have to be a member of Depth Psychology Alliance, but it's free to join. And I think you'll find lots of other interesting and exciting things. It's pretty full and busy and dynamic. There's uh, uh, almost 1,500 members now from all over the world there. And, uh, of course, we have all of the other months that are archived from the other book club months as well. Mark, thank you so much for spending your time with me today. If you'd like to find out more about Mark, you can visit his website at www.drmarkwinborn.com. And, Mark, your last name is spelled W-I-N-B-O-R-N. Correct. And, of course, you have a Facebook page as well. You can find him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash pages and look for Deep Blues, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journey. And then you also have a blog that you keep up, Mark. Can you tell us where to find that? If you just Google Psychoanalytic Muse, M-U-S-E, and that's a blog about psychoanalytic theories, both theories of Jung, Freud, but also all the contemporary theories that have emerged since the two founders kind of laid down the fundamentals of depth psychology. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much, Mark, for your time. It's been a real pleasure to have you with me today on Depth Insights. Thank you, Bonnie. I've really enjoyed the conversation and the opportunity to share the passion I feel about the blues. Thanks again, Mark.